Hello, I'm Doug Musio. This is City Talk. When I told my mother-in-law, Terry, that my next show was on Tammany Hall, she exclaimed, how corrupt were they? And boss Tweed? Yes, Terry, Tammany was corrupt, very corrupt, with brazen practitioners of both honest and dishonest craft. They saw their opportunities and they took them. They stole elections, they intimidated political opponents, they shook down contractors, but they also understood human nature. They protected the Irish from the depredations of the mercantile elite and the bigotry of the society. The New Deal, with its minimum wage, factory safety, women's short suffrage, short of work week, all of these were machine made. Here to talk about the forgotten virtues of Tammany Hall is Terry Galway, the director of the Kane University Center for History, Politics, and Policy in New Jersey. And he's the author of a delightfully revisionist view of Tammany Hall, Machine Made, Tammany Hall, and the Creation of Modern American Politics. Terry was a journalist for 30 years. He wrote for the New York Observer, the New York Times, and other venues, and he served on the Times editorial board for three years. Terry is a member of the Klan, the Micarati, as legendary journalist Dennis Duggan dubbed them. Welcome, Terry. Thanks, Doug. You'd characterize it a true crime story, a, a tale of larceny on a great scale. This is a very, very readable, but richly source, revisionist view of the machine. How did you come to write it? Well, you know, uh, uh, the Peter Quinn, to whom I dedicated the book, and... Uh, and, and he, noted authority on things Irish and political. Exactly. Peter and I spend our spare time uh, in pubs talking about Tammany Hall and why all of the historians have gotten it wrong. So after years of these discussions, and perhaps at great damage to our livers, I decided that uh, as a late in life PhD student, that this would be my dissertation. And the result is the book. You went back to academia at late, why? Well, uh, yeah, having, it, it was not an easy decision. Uh, the, you know, I, I was uh, a journalist for, since I was 17 years old. Uh -huh. I had gotten to the Times editorial board, which in journalism is sort of like being, you know, it's like being on the faculty at Harvard, you know, or, you know, CEO of GM, although that may not be the best. Right, as a matter of fact, they right. may be in GM. No, no, go right, ahead. Right, right. But, but in any case, you know, I kind of, uh, to, to sort of uh, misconstrue a Plunkett quote, you know, I saw the future, uh, you know, and I didn't want to go there. Right. It sounds like something Plunkett would say. So uh, I, I was offered a job at Kane University. Uh, I didn't have a PhD at the time, but the president of the university was generous enough to say, you know, we could use somebody like you who can write, who can administrate. Uh, and then I uh, went back to Rutgers University and got my PhD over seven years studying part-time. And, uh, and now I am a full-fledged academic. But to be honest with you, at the end of the day, I still consider myself a journalist. Well, I mean, you can see it in the writing because this is this is in this is a page turner, and in, in, in many ways, this is a, this is this is the, the source of a screenplay or a Broadway play. Well, let's hope somebody who's listening will say, you know what, Doug, you're right. Let's give Terry Galway a lot of money for right. the screenplay. Come on, yeah. let's. I mean, you know, do I get any credit? Absolutely, Somewhere? Okay. you're a finder's fee right oh, here. Hey, yeah. thank you. Okay, before we get to the past and the book. Are party machines passe? If you look at the 2013 election, Bill de Blasio won the Democratic primary without the party bosses at all. Right. Is this, is this sort of the, the end of the end for the party machines, or we had too many epitaphs already? I think we've had a lot of epitaphs. I mean, if, if Fiorella LaGuardia, de Blasio's hero, 
we're here, and we, would, and we were discussing in 2014, is this the end of the party machine? Mm -hmm. LaGuardia would say, my life was in vain. <laughs> that, that's, well, oh, no, and then we can answer, no, you contributed to its demise. Well, that, fair enough, fair enough. But I think that there's always a place for organization in politics. I mean, you can't succeed in politics without some sort of organization. Teddy Roosevelt once said that any political organization aspires to and indeed should be a machine his issue was, well, what does the machine do once it gets power? Right. Right. So I would argue that as long as there are organized political parties, or in the case of Democrats, disorganized political parties, <laughs> right. uh, there will be some element of a machine. It, it's true, as you said, Christine Quinn was sort of the candidate of the, of the bosses of right, the Right, of the more established and, party organization. Exactly. And she lost. Next time around, the, the candidate of the party bosses may win. Okay. Tammany, let's go to Tammany Hall. Tammany Hall is several things. Number one, it's a, it is a physical building. Yes. In fact, it's on 17th Street, yep. right off um, Union, Square. Union Square East. Yep. You can go there, and that's the last of the Tammany buildings. There was a, at right. least two prior. There were at least two prior. There was one on 14th Street. Uh, that was built in 1868, 68, it was and built. that was the Democratic National Convention. That exactly, year. exactly. So that, well, that was how Tammany Hall, the building, you know, gained its first fame, uh, hosting the Democratic Convention in, in 1868. Uh, and there had been other clubhouses as well. But when Tammany was built on 14th Street, that was sort of the big coming of age, if you will, of Tammany Hall as a structure, but also as a sort of metaphor. Okay, yeah, okay. So, let, so it's a building, it's a place, but it's also a metaphor, as you mentioned. A metaphor for what? Well, I, it, it, metaphor well, may not even be the right word. Well, what, it, what it is, in essence, is yeah, Tammany Hall, the Society of Tammany, was a private organization founded in the 1780s, a bunch of guys getting together, drinking beer, talking about the Knicks, and then all of a sudden Aaron Burr says, wow, we ought to get... It's the Raccoon Lodge. Yeah. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Right. So Aaron Burr comes in and says, we've got all these guys here. First of the great Tammany figures, right. Aaron Burr. Go exactly. Ahead. Says, maybe we can get these people to vote as a block. And sure enough, they did, and that society eventually took over the Democratic Party in Manhattan. So in essence, when we talk about Tammany Hall, we're talking about the, the New York County Democratic Committee. That is to say, the Democratic Party in Manhattan. That's what Tammany Hall was. Okay. You make in this book, and, yeah, and you substantiate, I would argue, that... Tammany Hall is responsible for the creation of modern American politics. It's, it's the subheading of the book. And that they, Tammany wrote a new social contract. And this was extraordinarily important. And it's unrecognized, the, the sort of the untold history. Talk a little bit about the stereotype, Tammany's un, 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 blah, 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 blah the unenviable place of Tammany in modern American politics and modern mythology. Well, yeah, in mythology and in fact, you know, Tammany certainly was the center of, of a corrupt politics. I mean, there's no, as you said in the opening, you know, Tammany stole elections, although I would argue if they were so corrupt, they were awfully bad at stealing right. elections because right. they lost a lot of right. them. You know? right. But I, I would say that they probably stole the uh, mayoral election of 1886 when Henry George, the, yep. single, the radical yes. economist, you know, is, is, is the biggest threat, right? To the and, established mercantile elite. Exactly. And when Tammany nominated their own sort of mercantile elite to, to counter that, and when ballots were spoiled and such, most of the civic elites who normally hated Tammany they didn't ask too many questions about how Henry George lost the 1886 election. And in the sort of a mirror development, in 1905, when William, Ra William Randolph Hearst right. was running on this sort of demagogic populist uh, campaign for mayor, Tammany probably stole that election in favor of George McClellan Jr., who again was an establishment candidate. And in both cases, you didn't hear too many complaints from the established press about Tammany corruption, because if they did steal the election, they stole it actually on behalf of the status quo. You well, know. I, I, I guess they didn't want any rivals in George's labor-based uh, approach in yes. 1886. Yes. would have been dramatically counted to the more conservative, if you will, Tammany Hall. Or moderate, machine. anyway. Moderate, yes. okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But, yeah. but by the same token, though, Doug, I mean, 
Tammany suffered catastrophic uh, losses. Uh, for example, in 1913, in the mayoral election, where John Peroy Mitchell, who was sort of LaGuardia before LaGuardia, right. he wins, uh, becomes the boy mayor, the youngest mayor ever elected, uh, and on an avowed anti-Tammany ca uh, campaign. And then in 1914, Tammany loses the gubernatorial campaign to Charles Whitman, a, a reactionary conservative. Right. So in two years, Tammany, you know, is is wiped out. So I would argue, if they were so venal and corrupt. And these elections were so important. Why didn't they steal those? And the answer is really, it's, it, it is a myth about Tammany constantly stealing votes and stealing elections. They were corrupt, but as you suggest, they also were responsible for making the social welfare system that we know of today by including immigrants. By in, 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 When the Irish took over Tammany in the 1870s, there were two things that they could have done. One is they could have acted to the new immigrants the way they were treated right. by nativists. Right. Not or, very well. Not very well. But not very well. Or they could be inclusive and pluralistic. And I would argue that, you know, particularly with the large Jewish population that came into New York during the Ellis Island generation, that they were inclusive, that they were pluralistic. And these, of course, are virtues that we associate with modern politics. That's exactly right. And in fact, uh, Plunkett of Tammany Hall, which I've, I've told you I regard as one of the two great works of American politics, along with the Federalist Papers, he goes to the funerals of Italians. They were Dagos then, or Jews, or blacks. I mean, there's a real, you know, they were voters, and it was very transactional. You traded favors for votes, and when they voted, it didn't matter they were black or Italian or Irish. So there was that element of that as, as well. But you point out that... Tammany Hall and Irish become synonymous, even though Burr was a Protestant, Boss Tweed was a Protestant. Really, the, the machine doesn't become the machine, and it doesn't become Irish until Honest John Kelly, one of the great characters. So we're going to do some characters. Do Honest John Kelly. Well, Honest John Kelly was the son of Irish immigrants. Uh, he was a member of Congress in 1855. Now, the, the, the reason that that's important is because in 1854, there was a wave of know-nothingism, even here in New York. Bill Tweed was a congressman from the East Side. He, he chooses not to run for re-election, and New York sends to Congress the founder of the know-nothing movement, Thomas Whitman. And the know-nothings were, were whom? Well, they were anti-immigrants. Well, they were anti-immigrant. They wanted to, uh, they, they said that uh, no immigrant should be able to vote, should be able to hold office. They were very anti-Catholic as well. They saw these Catholic immigrants as threats to American liberties. So in 1855, there is one Catholic left in Congress, and it's John Kelly. And he gives this amazing speech on the House floor in which he says, in essence, the persecutor of today may be the persecuted of tomorrow. So that's where he sort of establishes his credibility. And then when Tweed is overthrown in 1871, the uh, Tammany turns to its first Irish boss, Honest John Kelly, and he gets that nickname because as the sheriff of New York County, he was considered to be relatively honest. So it wasn't an ironic nickname. And he takes, I think, he very consciously takes the hierarchical uh, structure of the Catholic Church and says, this is how we're going to do it. Yep. We're going to have a pope. That's going to be me, the boss. right? We're going to have the cardinals. That will be the district leaders, the members of the executive committee. Then we're going to have the parish priests. These are going to be the famous ward healers that you hear so much about, who were indeed not corrupt. These were the eyes and ears of the organization, like I said, the, power, uh, the, the parish priests. And all power flowed from the top. Because one thing Kelly didn't like is these ward healers and others kind of doing deals on the side nice. without any sort of discipline and any sort of organization. And what, and what Kelly said is, if you bring out the vote on election day, then welcome to the table. If, the, if you don't bring out the vote on election day, I'll find somebody who right. will. Right, right. And because Tweed, the Tweed ring was exactly that. It was a loose confederacy of crooked. That's Kelly that makes, the, I mean, the machine with the cogs that you're talking about really begins with Kelly. Let's go back to another character. One of my absolute favorite characters being a graduate of Fordham was Dagger John Hughes, the Archbishop of New York, who really in some ways makes New York City politics Irish politics. Absolutely. Now, you can read every Tammany book there is, and I'll bet you have, I know I have, 
uh, and there's no t book that includes John Hughes. Not to, not, not to the extent you talk about right. him, as central to this game. And the reason I think he's important is because he is, I think, the first Irish boss. He's a cleric, he's a bishop, he's loathed by the nativists, and he sees these immigrants being treated very poorly. Uh, this is the time of the Irish famine, so you've got these, the first real huddled masses coming into New York, these famine immigrants who are starving, who probably speak Irish, at least most of them, who have nothing but the clothes on their back. And they're treated terribly by the nativists. They need a leader, and that leader is Dagger John Hughes, the, you know, the bishop, the Catholic bishop, and he at one point uh, uh, organizes his own political party because he feels that the Irish immigrants are not getting respect. In the public schools, you're being forced to read the King public James Bible. Public schools, again, yes. being a key issue. This key is one issue. of these great school wars. Absolutely. It, it, Diane Ravitch wrote a wonderful book Excellent. about it. And, but it's funny because the same kind of war over what kind of textbooks are we going to read, what is the curriculum going to be, how inclusive is the curriculum going to be, that same thing took place in Ireland in the 1820s, and it was Protestant versus Catholic. The Catholic Irish come to New York, and it's the same thing. So Hughes tries to work with politicians, is getting nowhere. Interestingly, his main ally is Governor William Seward, right. a Whig, right. not a Democrat, right. not a Tammany Democrat. But very astute. Yes, and an abolitionist. Most abolitionists at the time were anti-Catholic, but not Seward. Right. And so they're trying to figure out how w New York is going to incorporate these new immigrants. And Hughes eventually throws up his hands and says, the only way this is going to happen is if we run our own people. Right, political power. Exactly. And you, ex and you exercise Yes. It. That's what it's all about. That's what it's all the about. The exercise of political power. Okay. Talk about the status of the Irish in New York and, 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 and related to, to Ireland because uh, the, 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 the connections between Ireland, the government of Ireland, the politics of Ireland, and Irish-American politics is, is really very close. And there's this narrative that you mentioned of, of, of Irish degeneracy and that this is the prevailing view. This is the story about the Irish. Talk about that. Well, you know, one of the things that, that, that many people have said about Tammany Hall, including the late, great Daniel Patrick Moynihan, is that if you want to understand Irish attitudes towards power, you can't start on the Lower East Side. Right. You have to go back to Ireland to see how power was distributed and wielded in Ireland. Well, a lot of academics said you should do that, but I actually did. So I went back to the hey, archives listen. in Dublin, right? So that, and that's my contribution, I suppose. But what I found is that there is this sort of not to get all academic on you, Doug, but there is a sort of transit. I know that, that that was meant ironically. Oh, I thought so. I just <laughs> missed it. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. But there is this sort of transatlantic, transnational narrative of Irish degeneracy, as mm -hmm. you said, that the Irish were poor because of uh, defects in their character. Does that sound familiar to yes. today? Uh, that they were. They're substance abusers. Right. They're substance abusers. They're lazy. They're violent. They're violent, and they can't be trusted with to know what their own good. You know, to vote in their own interest. So, needless to say, the elites have to make all these decisions for them. That's what's happening in Ireland. You know, even during the famine, or I should say, especially during the famine. Uh, if you wanted assistance, you had to prove that you were worthy. And in many cases, proving you were worthy meant converting to Protestantism. So the Irish see the way power is wielded in Ireland. They come... Wow. That's you can cool. tell this is live television, uh, live to tape. Uh, you, in, in, our, in New York, they come here and they find the same narrative. They find Protestant charities, well-meaning, I'm sure, like the Children's Aid Society, and people are being asked to prove that they're worthy of, of private assistance. Sure. So uh, they rebel against that, just as they rebelled against it in Ireland. Tammany says, Tammany's very practical. Tammany says, we don't care about you. We're not here to judge. Right. Do you want help? Right. We'll give you, you help. You got burned out? We'll fix you we'll up. Fix we'll you. buy food, get you quarters. But. Come on, but. Remember us on election day. Right. It's a vote trading organization. They're trading favors for votes. Because and when very you're, successfully. When you're poor, Doug, in a democracy, you do have one thing that should make you yep. as powerful as Donald Trump, and that's your vote. Yep, exactly. 
And the Irish, you know, it was it was just striking the the anti-Irish bigotry. I mean, you can see it in in the cartoons. I mean, whether it's Nast with well Tweed in terms of the machine, but Irish being portrayed as simians, the Catholic Church, the 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 the, the, the clergy as alligators. I mean, and then my favorite, one of my favorite uh, poets, you quote. You know, Walt Whitman talking about the filthy Irish rabble. So, yeah, the I mean, poet of the, the common content, man. Yeah, the right. poet of the common man. Right. You know, different type of uh, common men. So, you talked about, you know, there were these high points and low points in Tammany, you know, there these ups and downs. But in 1902, with, with Richard Croker's death, Tammany enters a golden age under Charlie Murphy. Talk about Charlie Murphy and talk about the. Tammany Hall is a paradigm for the new politics, the new liberalism, the new deal. Well, you know, Murphy, uh, who is really one of the heroes in my book, of course, uh, he takes over Tammany, as you said, after Croker. And in the beginning, it does seem that, you know, that nothing big has changed. Although one of the things Murphy said is, I don't want Tammany involved in police corruption. I don't want Tammany involved in the rackets. I don't want Tammany involved in prostitution, all of which probably was happening under Croker. So he, in essence, he cleans up Tammany, and then he decides, particularly after the Triangle Shirtwaist fire... In, Which is a seminal event. Seminal event in American history. Yes, and right. certainly in New York history, and as Tammany translates that through Wagner and... Uh, and Al Smith. Al Smith into right. policy. I'm, right. Go ahead, you talk. So, but, but even before then, Smith was... Be, I mean, rather, Murphy, the, who is the a child of a famine immigrant, which I think is, is significant, uh, because one of the things about people like Murphy is that they, they grew up poor, so they understood what it meant to be poor. Yep. And uh, they, uh, Murphy comes in and he realizes he's got these young people like Al Smith and Wagner and that times are changing. Now you could argue, was it simply political calculation on his part that, okay, uh, times are moving uh, to a more liberal uh, ethos, so Tammany will, or was it based on ideology? It doesn't matter to me. What matters is that uh, in 1913, two years after the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire, Tammany Hall passes measures like the beginnings of minimum wage, yep. uh, regulations about w workplace safety, uh, workers' compensation. Uh, the beginnings of the social network, uh, social welfare network start after the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire, but they're passed not by the reformers. Mm -mm. They're passed by the machine politicians who understand what it takes to get legislation passed. Right. And that's they know the, the game. They know the game. And they understand that the game is not perfect. That sometimes to get a bill passed, you may have to do a little horse trading. Or sometimes the bill may not be what you would want. Right. Like, for example, Tammany passed a, uh, a, a, a bill that um, limited the number of hours that women and children could work, but they exempted canneries, which were a big industry. And the cannery owners had a relationship with Charlie Murphy. Come on. All right. So they were exempted temporarily. And Tammany learned, it was Big Tim Sullivan, one of the other characters in my book, says... Another know, great character. Another great character, undoubtedly corrupt, but, but he gets it. He understands that government can and should be mobilized on behalf of the powerless. Yes. And sometimes you're going to get a bill that doesn't do everything you want, but if it's the beginning of something you want, just get it done. Right. The, the, the Jagger Richards law, you can't always get what you want, but if you try, sometimes you get what you need. Exactly. Why did it decline? So it's at the apex. What? It's dead, it's dead in the 60s, virtually. Talk yes. to me. Yes. Why? Well, I think some of the, some of the reason is its own success, right? They, they were about assimilating immigrants. By the 1930s, you know, uh, immigration had slowed as a result of the racist 1924 immigration right. restrictions, right. which Tammany opposed. And so they turned off the spigot of immigrants. Exactly. That, okay. Right, right. And uh, so, so in that sense, you know, their mission was over. Also, this idea of government being on the side of poor people, that debate was won. You know, the New Deal basically comes in and, and in a more systematic way, basically incorporates these Tammany ideas of government being on the side of immigrants and the poor, but now they institutionalize it. So now that you can get help as an entitlement, right. you don't have to go down to the clubhouse. Yes. 
You know? So they would they and also their constituents move away. They yes, don't need that's the, the other service. thing. They so don't they're need too it. successful. They are they, exactly. And mind you, there was also very poor leadership. I mean, Charlie Murphy dies in 1924 on the verge of seeing Al Smith, you know, become a national figure. Right, and then the presidential candidate in, in 1928. Right, but it, they, you know, Murphy was uh, the greatest leader Tammany ever had. The leadership after that was not very good. There was great resentment against Franklin Roosevelt. It was pure personal because Roosevelt that's a that's a story I know you're interested yes in. I'm very interested in that that FDR Al Smith story is particularly interesting yes particularly how Smith sort of loses it yes, in does. the 30s yes. really loses it. yes and it's very sad and, you know and people debate why you know, people say well you know he, while he he certainly did install all of these social welfare uh, laws and such that he thought the New Deal had gotten out of control Maybe. I think it, you know, as you know, Doug, you study politics, local politics. All politics is local, and local politics is personal. Right. And right. I do believe right. that every time Al Smith saw Franklin Roosevelt in the Oval Office, he envisioned himself there and felt that should have been me. And Roosevelt in 1932, when Smith thought that he should have been handed the nomination, right. Roosevelt says, oh, not so fast. Right. Well, he, he takes it. He and, takes and it. Fact. Right, right. So, in a sense, the, the, the New Deal is the high watermark of Tammany Hall. But uh, where, what is it, 1932, O'Brien becomes the, the, uh, the, well, the, the Walker mayor? Walker quits. Right. Walker quits. Right. You know, machine, machine uh, factotum. Yes. O'Brien, and they ask him who his first, who his police commissioner is. He says, I don't know. They haven't told, they haven't told me. Yet. Yeah. I mean, and then they get connected with the mob in the yes. 40s. And it's not until DeSapio. In, in the 50s, really, Tammany has a, tr a tremendous resurgence. He's on the cover of Time. He's yes. on the Democratic National Committee. And then he gets defeated in 61. Right. Wagner runs against him, the son of the senator, and it's over. Yes, and it should be over. It, it's its Go. mission was done. Uh, you know, it, it was not, there were many things Tammany was not. Tammany was also not about racial politics, per se. It really was about, you know, the Irish and then later the Jews and Italians. Uh, Italians, I mean, that's a, that's a whole nother, nother oh, story. Oh, yeah, well, too. I have my, yes. my beef with you, uh, yes. you know, people from the Emerald Isle. Well, absolutely. And the treatment the, of the, the, uh, the Irish. Pay, but right. parents and grandparents, it's, it's part of the legend. That's yes. a different narrative. It is a different narrative. Irish. I mean, the, the, the Irish treatment of Jews was much better than the treatment of Italians, and, and who knows why. I mean, I think it might have some sort of Catholic rivalry implicit in that. I just don't know. But by 1960, Tammany was a shell of itself. It had lost its purpose. Its, its main constituents had achieved the dream, the American right. dream. Right. They were no longer living on the Lower East Side. They were living on Staten Island in Queens, the Bronx, or God forbid, New Jersey. And or Long Island. Or no, Long God Island. forbid, New Jersey. <laughs> 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 Thank you. To Go ahead. Jersey, you too. Right. So, uh, so, so the mission was done. It, it, it failed because it had succeeded. Okay. Next one is what? Well, I'm very interested in the relationship that we just talked about between Al Smith and Franklin Roosevelt. There's I think definitely another uh, book length discussion of that. Because you know they're they're so important. They're such a, they're important characters in New York history, in American sure. history, in the history of the Democratic Party. And I would argue that. Roosevelt's connections with Al Smith, his connections with Tammany Hall, have been downplayed by yep. most of Roosevelt's biographers Good. because they want to see him as the ultimate patrician, civic elite Saint reformer. FDR. Saint right. FDR. Thank you. And okay. you know what? It's more complicated than that. My thanks to Terry Galway for being on the show and for a great read, Machine Made, Tammany Hall and the Creation of Modern American Politics, here on CUNY TV. Terry, excellent. Hello, I'm Doug Musio. Let us know what you think about this show. You can reach us at cuny.tv. When you get there, click on the bar that says contact us and send your email. Whatever it is, thanks, no thanks, obnoxious, do it. Send it.